good evening, everyone. Welcome to our service, and a special welcome to Robert Scriptures. Come take our service seat and thank you very much. Services as we continue on Tuesday with our Bible study at 7.30. If you want to read ahead, it's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. Wednesday morning, coffee morning, for those regulars, it's a different time this week. It's not 10 o'clock, it's 11 o'clock, because it's going to be followed by the coronation lunch. So that's why it's starting an hour later. And I said this morning, if you turn up the hour earlier at 10 o'clock, you'll probably just get roped in and doing all the preparations. So <laughs> avoid that, turn up at 11 o'clock. Wednesday evening continues at 5.30 and 6.30 with two clubs for the children. And next Sunday morning begins at 10.15 with a prayer meeting. I'm taking the morning service at 11 o'clock and Andrew will be taking the evening service at 6.30. I know this week we'll invest value your prayers. They're planning to lead a lot of the youth work at the English Reverend Conference Convention next weekend. So I'm adding another value your prayers for the preparation for that as well. And also members still a Bible study in prison on Monday. The last couple of weeks there have been some logistic problems of people actually getting to the Bible study of the prisoners. So please pray for that situation. And especially one of the prisoners, Glenn, who was going out on the weekend. Pray for him especially as he's gone back home, his home situation. Pray for all of them. So for your prayers, there's school assemblies Wednesday and should be Thursday this week. The dad at Sowood School, but we're not sure about the Thursday one because we found out today there's a teacher strike on this Thursday. So last time that was on, the assembly was cancelled. Side of that, you've got a load of children control, no teachers. <laughs> That's really all notice is just let's still continue to remember to pray for one another, especially those in the church with health issues at this time. Thank you very much. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we can meet together this evening. We thank you for this day, for the Lord's Day, when we meet to worship you particularly, and you bless us with your presence as we listen to your word and sing your praises and bring you prayer and thanksgiving. We pray that you would be with us now, that you would help us, help us to focus on what we're doing, to think about the words of what we sing, to take in what we hear from the Bible and from what we hear from it. Speak to us, we pray, Lord God, and do us good and bless us as we meet together in this way. Forgive all our sins, we ask, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We'll sing together hymn number one in the hymn book. Hymn number one. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with fear, his praise forth tell. Come now before him and rejoice. Number one.
We'll hear now from God's Word in the Gospel according to Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, at the end of Luke's Gospel, after the resurrection of Christ, Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. So this is the day of the Lord's resurrection, he rose from the tomb early in the morning, and this is a little later in the day. Luke 24, verse 13. Now behold, two of them were travelling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. (coughs) Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to the most foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour, and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. We thank God for his word. We're going to sing again. This is number 187. I think the emphasis in this hymn is on faith. We know by faith. We surely know what we know. We know that the Son of God is come, manifested. He's been made known here below. He makes our hearts his home. To us he has in gracious love and understanding given to recognise him from above, just as these Two disciples were given to recognise the Lord Jesus on that road to Emmaus when the Lord opened their eyes. So by faith we come to recognise Christ for who he is, the Lord of heaven, the Lord of earth and heaven. One eight seven. Oh. 
Let's again join together in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, how we give you thanks for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We praise you that he has come down into our world, that he's taken to himself human flesh, a human nature, and lived as one of us upon this earth 2,000 years ago. We thank you for the reality of this, that you really did live as a boy, as a young man, as an adult, walking the streets of Galilee, and then of Judea and Jerusalem, teaching and healing, raising the dead even. Thank you, Lord God, that these things truly happened as we read of them in your word, in the Gospels. And we praise you that he died on that cross at Golgotha outside Jerusalem for the sins of all his people. We thank you that he was buried in the tomb and lay there for three days and then on the third day rose again from the dead triumphantly. We praise you that he has so won the victory over sin and over death and that he lives now forevermore and that he prays and makes intercession for all his people. We thank you for these great historical facts that they are true and we thank you that through these acts through these means you have provided salvation for all your people <coughs> thank you and praise you lord god that by your grace we may turn from our sin and trust in christ and know this salvation for ourselves we thank you that it is complete a salvation that's complete we thank you we let need add nothing to it or bring anything to it we thank you that whatever we have been and whatever we are and whatever we've done, we may through faith be saved through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross. We praise you and we thank you for the cross. <coughs> we thank you for that place where our Saviour bore the sin of all his people, where he became a curse, a curse for us, that we might know the blessing of you, of God Almighty through faith in him. We pray you would help us, Lord God, help us, those of us who know Christ, that we would walk with him, that this coming week you would help us, Lord God, to walk lives, to live lives that are worthy of our Saviour. Forgive us, we pray, for the many times when we sin still against you, and we do not live and speak and act as we should in accordance with your word, but we go our own way and please ourselves Lord, of God, have, Lord God, have mercy upon us, we pray. Cleanse us from sin. Through the blood of Christ, we ask. We thank you for this church and for its testimony here in Froome and pray for your blessing upon each member of the congregation and upon the witness of this church. We pray that many would come in and hear the good news of Jesus Christ and be saved. We pray that here and in Bradford and Avon and Westbury and Trowbridge and Melksham and Bath and all around this area, there would be many conversions in coming weeks and months and years. That you would be pleased to add to your churches. That your churches would grow to your praise and glory, and that many would be saved. We pray for the various outreach ministries of this church. We pray for the work in the prisons. We pray, Lord God, for these matters that were mentioned earlier in the notices and ask that you would be pleased to hear the prayers of your people and make these ministries very fruitful and effective uh, we ask we pray for the lunch and coffee morning uh, on wednesday for your blessing upon that that many would come and hear uh, the good news of the gospel we pray for the work amongst the young people and in schools lord god we Lament the fact that young people, children growing up hear so little, if anything, about the Bible and the good news of Jesus Christ. But we thank you for these opportunities and pray that as your people seek to communicate uh, the gospel, something of the scriptural, the truths of scripture to these children and young people, that they would be attentive 
and would uh, listen well, and that uh, seed would be sown that would bear fruit uh, in time to come. So Lord God, we pray that you would help each one of us, help those who know the Saviour to grow in him. May our faith in him increase. May we come to know him more and more as we learn from your word and hear him preach by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray as we come shortly to listen to your word being preached, that you would give us attentive minds and hearts, that we would learn from your word, that you would increase our faith, that you would help us to live to your glory. For Christ's sake we ask all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn is on the screen. It's uh, the hymn, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. Church, thank you for your prayers for us. We pray for you. Uh, we've been encouraged recently by the baptism uh, on Easter Sunday, which was very encouraging. Uh, we have a outreach planned in May um, in some of the new developments on the edge of the town. So do please remember us in prayer as we seek to reach uh, reach them with the gospel and uh, bring them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do value fellowship with you in the gospel. I'm going to look this evening at the passage that I read from Luke chapter 24, the final chapter of Luke's gospel, this um, journey that these two disciples were making. They were disciples of the Lord Jesus, clearly, but like the other disciples had been disheartened, frightened, scared by the arrest of the Lord Jesus, by the treatment that he received from the Jewish leaders, from the Romans, and then of course by his death 
on the cross and were wondering what had happened, what had happened to their leader, to their teacher, to the one who they hoped would be their saviour and redeemer, though they didn't really understand what those words meant at this point. And so they seem to have really almost given up. The other disciples seem to have stayed in, in the city of Jerusalem, but these two seem to have decided that really there's no point in doing that and um, they were just going to go, well probably home, we don't know that they were going home, they were going to this village called Emmaus in verse 13, uh, which Luke tells us was about seven miles from the city of Jerusalem. So for whatever reason, whether they were going home or on their way home or whatever it might be, that's where they, that's where they decided to go. We know the name of one of them, Cleopas, verse 18, we don't know who the other one was, uh, a friend, some people suggest perhaps it was his wife, it's possible, uh, we're not told. So these two make their way out of the city, out of Jerusalem, rather despondent, rather sad, as we see in the passage, and well, I've read to you what happened. They met the Lord Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. The question that this passage raises for us, though, is this, or one of the questions, one of the main questions it raises is this, how do we know the Lord Jesus? How do we know the Lord Jesus Christ? How do we come to know him for the first time? And then how do we get to know him better? How do we increase in our knowledge, our relationship, if you like, with the Lord Jesus Christ? If you're a Christian, you surely want to do that. You want to get to know the Lord Jesus better. You want to have a closer relationship with him. You want to not just know more about him, but, but know him better as your Lord and as your saviour, as your elder brother. If you're not a Christian this evening, well, I would suggest to you that the, 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 the most important thing for you is to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to know this person, as so many of us here this evening do. And again, the question is, how do you do that? How do you come to know Jesus Christ? So that's the question we're going to try and answer from this passage, and we want to look at it under three headings. Firstly, let's just note the fact that as is evident, as we've seen, Jesus appeared to these disciples alive. As we've said, he died, he really died. You know, some people want to make out he just fainted or went into a coma and, and then revived. That's clearly not possible, it's not the case, it's not what the histories tell us. He died. He died as you and I one day will die. And the disciples knew it, they knew he was dead, they saw him, or some of them at least saw him being laid in the tomb, his dead body being laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But now we see him in this chapter alive again. He's died, he died, he was dead, he was buried, now he is alive, walking and talking. So he is alive, but things are not quite as straightforward as we might think, as the, these two disciples show us. Now, these two disciples knew, they knew more than perhaps you might think. Picture them again, walking away from Jerusalem, along the road, a dusty road, no doubt in the heat of the evening by this point. But they knew certain things, look at verse 22. So um, they're talking now with Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus. They're explaining to Jesus what has happened. Jesus knows very well what's happened, of course. But he, he's letting them talk to him and explain it all. And in verse 22, they say, yes, and certain women of our company, some of the women disciples who arrived at the tomb early, astonished us. They didn't find his body. They came saying they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. So they heard that. They didn't just rush off from Jerusalem before they'd heard certain things. And, and uh, earlier in the chapter, Mary, uh, Luke has told us um, in verse 10 uh, of some of these women who had gone to the tomb early, as 
were told, and, and found the tomb empty, and the angels had spoken to them and told them that Jesus was risen from the dead. So that, that, that's, that, that encounter between the women and the angels at the tomb, and the report that the tomb was empty, which is an amazing thing, isn't it? The tomb where they'd laid the body of Jesus was now empty. That report had got back to the disciples, and these two had heard that. And they knew more than that. They knew that Peter and John had visited the tomb, verse 24. Uh, certain of those who were with us, um, they don't give their names, but um, Luke and the other Gospel writers tell us that it was Peter, the Apostle, and John um, who went to the tomb after the women, in response to the women's report. Peter and John went to the tomb and found indeed that it was, it was indeed empty. Um, but as far as these two disciples know, uh, none of them saw Jesus. In fact, Mary did see Jesus, and, and Jesus met with some of the other women as well on their way back. Uh, but these two don't seem to have known that. So they knew quite a lot, they didn't know everything as to what had happened. And so, uh, as we've said, they were, they were walking now back to Emmaus, about seven miles away. And they were discussing everything, well, that's, you'd expect that, wouldn't you? They were talking about everything that had happened, verse 14. All these things which had happened, they talked together. You can imagine it, you know it, you've been to an event, you've been somewhere, you've enjoyed it, or it's disturbed you, or puzzled you, and you're going back, you're going home with somebody else, and you talk about it in the car, or on the train, or the bus, or whatever it is. And it's, it's in that context, then, that Jesus appears to them. Just as Jesus appeared to, to Mary in the garden and to some of the other women, um, Jesus appears to these two. Verse 15, he drew near and went with them, but they didn't recognise him. They didn't, rec they didn't know who it was. That's puzzling, isn't it? Because they knew Jesus, they knew what he looked like. Did he look different? Well, it was more supernatural than that, verse 16. They were, they were held back, they were, their eyes were restrained. The implication is supernaturally by God, by Christ, so that they didn't, they didn't recognise him. They just took him to be somebody else. So you can imagine they're walking along the, 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 the road and a, a third person, another man, comes up behind them and, and joins them quite natural in one sense, um, but they didn't recognise it as Jesus. They took him to be somebody else. Verse 18, uh, just a visitor, a stranger. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happened there in these days? Jesus says, what things? They didn't recognise him. They didn't know who it was. That's interesting in itself, isn't it? There was nothing unusual about Jesus. He didn't have a halo or shining clothes. or you know, he, just looked, he just looked like a normal person, just like somebody else who might be going the same way as them who's joined them on the journey. And there he was, alive, walking with them, talking with them, but they didn't recognise him. It was only later on uh, as they arrived at their destination and they invited Jesus in to share a meal with them as he broke bread with them they realised who he was and he disappeared and then you notice what happened then um, when he vanished verse 31 uh, they said well we're going to go back to Jerusalem verse 33 that was late, seven miles quite a long way to walk but that didn't deter them. They got up and they went back to Jerusalem, met with the other disciples, told them what they'd seen, heard from the others what had happened, and rejoiced together. Well, what do you make of all this? It's a fascinating, interesting episode, isn't it? What do you make of it? The risen Jesus walked and talked with these two people, but they did not realise who he was, they didn't know him, until he chose to make himself known to them. Well, well, we'll, we'll think more about it, come on to our second point. We've just seen so far that Jesus is alive, and
and he's met with these people, these two people, and uh, talked with them. But secondly, let's notice that he spoke to them from the Old Testament. He, Jesus spoke to them from the Old Testament, verse 27. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, meaning, of course, the Old Testament scriptures, the New Testament wasn't written at this time, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He spoke to them from the Bible. So this is our, our second point. Who did Jesus' disciples then think that this was? We can see here, can't we, from the conversation that they had with Jesus, what their expectations were about Jesus. Uh, and even their amazement that Jesus appeared to know nothing about his own death, uh, as Jesus hadn't revealed them who he was. See, some of Jesus' disciples saw him as a great prophet. They knew his miracles. They saw him raise people from the dead. They saw him betrayed. And they hoped, as these two say in verse 21, they hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And what they meant by that was beat the Romans, throw the Romans out of the land, restore the land of Israel to uh, the Jewish people. So that they could live a life again, free from the Romans, free from oppression, uh, and hopefully in line with the word of God. That was what they expected. That was what they were hoping from Jesus. They hadn't really grasped, you see, what Jesus came for. Jesus came to redeem them in a much greater sense than that, redeem them from sin and from death itself. They hadn't seen that at all. They'd also, as we've said, heard from the women and from Peter and John that the tomb was empty and the body was gone, but what was their response to that? You'd think their response to that was, would be perhaps joy. That's our response, because we know what it means. But again, they, didn't, they hadn't understood. They didn't know what this meant. In fact, we're told they were sad. Verse 24. Uh, certain of those who were with us uh, went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Sorry, wrong reference. Where is it? Oh, it's verse 17. Jesus says to them, what, what are you talking about? What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? They were, they were sad. They knew the tomb was empty, but it didn't produce joy in them. They were sad. So these two, they were perplexed. They were confused. They hadn't understood really who Jesus is and what he had come to do. And they were sad even though they knew that the tomb was empty. Now, let's just imagine that you've got up to verse um, 24 in the story. So they've, they've had this conversation with Jesus, but they haven't yet realized who he is. What would you expect Jesus to do? What would you think he might say next in response to them? I think what I would expect, if I didn't know what happened, what I'd expect is for Jesus simply to say to them, look, it's me. I'm, here I am. I'm the one you're talking about. I'm alive. I'm risen from the dead. That's why the tomb was empty. Rejoice. I'm here. But he doesn't say that, does he? Isn't that a bit strange? Isn't that a bit odd? A little bit surprising. He doesn't say that at all. It's not until much later that he allows them to realise that it is him. What he does, first of all, is to rebuke them in verse 25. You can see it there in the passage. He says to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. He rebukes them for their lack of faith. Do you see that? That's what he means when he says slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. He's rebuking them, but they, 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 they don't have faith, they don't believe, they don't trust in what God has said through his prophets. That's Jesus' concern. 
That's what Jesus says they lack. That's what they need. They need faith in him. If he just said, oh, it's me, you know, it's Jesus, I'm here, I'm risen, everything's all right, it might have cheered them up, would have surprised them and amazed them, but it wouldn't have addressed this basic issue with them, their lack of faith. And it's the same with you and me. Our basic issue, our basic problem, is a lack of faith in what God has said and what God has promised in his word. And that's, I suggest that's true for all of us, whether we're Christians or not. Our faith needs to be strengthened. We're too often like these two disciples. We're foolish, we're slow of heart to believe all that God has said in his word. And that's why we become anxious, and we worry, and we backslide sometimes, and we grow cold in our hearts, and we sin, and we don't obey God and trust him as we ought, because of the slowness of our hearts, because of our lack of faith. Jesus addresses this. And then you see what he does. He preaches to them. He speaks to them from the scriptures about himself, verse 27, beginning at Moses, so right at the beginning of the Old Testament, and all the prophets, so all the way through the Old Testament, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So again, he doesn't just say to them, look, it's me, I'm risen from the dead. No, he takes them to the word of God. He takes them to God's word. And again, this is where you and I need to be pointed. Our great need, your great need, my great need is for our faith in Christ to be strengthened. And how is that going to happen? Well, it's through the word of God. We need to be pointed to what God has said and what God has promised in his word. Not just, of course, the Old Testament, because we have the New Testament as well. The whole of the scriptures in order to learn from them what God has said, what God teaches us from the scriptures about Christ. That's, that's the reason why we spend so much time with the Bible. That's the reason why in churches like this one and, and, and Bradford and, and, and churches that are similar, we, we spend so much time listening to preaching. I think, why are the sermons so long? Why do we why do we always spend so much time with the Bible? We don't just hear it preached, we have it read in the service, and, and many of the hymns we sing are taken from the Bible one way or another. Why is that? Why is that? Well, because we need to learn and understand and know more of what God has said in his word so that we might know Christ, so that our faith might be strengthened. This is how we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the question I put at the beginning of the message, and, and this is the answer. We come to know the Lord Jesus Christ through his word. That's what this is about, isn't it? This is what Jesus is doing himself, the risen Jesus is doing with these two people. He's seeking to deepen their faith through the word of God from the Old Testament. <clears throat> Now, it'd be lovely, wouldn't it, in one sense, if Jesus appeared now in this meeting himself. And you think, well, why doesn't he? Well, he could. Why doesn't he? Well, clearly he doesn't, because that's not the best thing for us. The best thing for us, the best thing to help us in this life, as you and I seek to serve God and to live for Christ, the best thing, it's not that we have visions of Christ or that he appears to us bodily, as it were. The best thing is for us to grasp the teaching of the scriptures, the teaching of God in his word about the Lord Jesus Christ and to believe in, to have faith, to have our faith strengthened through the word of God. That's what we need. That's what we need. I can't emphasize this enough. It's absolutely essential. And you can see it in practice here in this encounter between Jesus and the two disciples. What they needed most of all was not so much to see Jesus and meet him alive, although they did actually do that on this journey. They needed to see the risen Jesus so that they could be witnesses to the resurrection as the other apostles were. But that wasn't their greatest need. 
The first thing that Jesus does with them, as we've seen, is to open up the scriptures to them about himself, so as to strengthen their faith. That's what we need. We need to see Christ, we need to know Christ, in this way, from the Word, from the Scriptures, as He truly is, presented to us in the Bible as risen, <coughs> alive, a Saviour, who died for sinners on the cross, was buried, but rose again from the dead, triumphant, as our Redeemer, as our Lord, as our King. That's our great need. More than our need for health, more than our need for anything in this world, we need Jesus Christ. And so does everybody else. If you're not a Christian, again this evening, if your faith is not in Christ, this is your greatest need. You may have many other needs. They may be legitimate needs, valid needs that need to be met. But this is your great need because it's to do with your eternal destination. It's to do with your eternal state, not just with your time in this life is to do with what happens to you after you die. You need to come to know Jesus Christ. So you may be saved from death and from hell itself. You need to come to know Christ. And the believer, as I've said, need to know Christ better than we do. It's a lifelong thing, isn't it? It's a lifelong thing for the believer. Getting to know Jesus better every day. What a wonderful thing that is. And how do we do it? Through the teaching of scripture, focusing on Jesus Christ, on his sufferings, on his death, his resurrection, his glory, his work of salvation, and all that he has done, all that he's taught, his great miracles, but above all, in the work of salvation. And that's why in our services we spend so much time in the scriptures, listening to them being read, being preached, singing them, even praying on the basis of the scriptures. This is why the preaching of God's word is so important. It's why we give it so much attention. It's why it's so important that we listen to it. It's why it's so vital that you come regularly to hear the word of God being preached every week, unless you're prevented from coming. Come and hear the word of God being preached, because it will do you good as it points you to Jesus Christ. It's not just to give preachers a job, it's not just to feed the preacher's sense of his own importance, far from it. It's so that you and I may know Jesus and the salvation that he alone brings. And so we must be determined, we must be committed to this, just as we eat three meals a day or whatever it might be in order to feed our bodies, so we must be determined that, well, at least once or twice a week on the Lord's Day, hopefully twice, we will come and hear the word of God being opened up and preached. We listen to what the Bible has to say about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will strengthen our faith. You know when you eat a meal, you don't always take very much notice of it. Perhaps not always the most delicious meal you've ever had, but you know it does you good. You know it strengthens you, you do it, it becomes part of your daily life. So it should be, shouldn't it, with the listening and the attending on the preaching of the Word of God. We need to hear Christ preach regularly for the good of our souls, to strengthen our faith, to help us in our walk with Christ. And that brings us to our final point, thirdly, Jesus opened their eyes to see and believe. So we're saying that to know Jesus Christ we need to see him and hear him preached uh, from the scriptures. We need to see him there in God's word and learn about him there and meet him there and know him there. But you see, <clears throat> these disciples had all, the, all of that, which I've just said in verse 27, but they still didn't know who he was. So on the road... They're walking along, Jesus is explaining all of this from the Old Testament, verse 27, expounding that there must have been the most amazing Bible study, showing them in the Old Testament all about himself, but they still don't know who he is, that he's with them. They get to where they're staying, 
They say, come in, have a meal. He stays, he eats with them, he breaks bread. And then, verse 31, then their eyes were opened and they knew him. And at that point he vanished from their sight. And then the testimony that uh, they gave to the disciples when they got back to Jerusalem, much later, verse 35, they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So why was it? Why was it that they didn't recognise him when he was speaking to them from the word of God, but later on, they did. What made the difference? Was it their own insight? You know, they thought about these things as they were going along, they sat down to the meal and suddenly it all clicked and made sense and they realised by the power of their own wisdom that it was Jesus. No, it wasn't that. Was it something in his mannerisms, perhaps? Something the way he broke the bread, perhaps? Some people have suggested from verse 35 that uh, caused them to see that it was Jesus. No, it wasn't that. Verse 31, their eyes were opened. Well, who opened them? It talks about their eyes. Of course, it means their, their understanding. That's what it means. They, they saw that it was Jesus. <coughs> well, who did that? Well, clearly, Luke is telling us it, it's God, it's the Lord himself who did that. The Lord opened their eyes. And that's what you and I need. It's not enough just for us to study the scriptures. It's not enough for us just to get to know the Bible better. It's good, of course, to study the scriptures and to get to know the Bible better. It's not enough just to listen to the preaching of, of, of the word. That's good. We must do that, as we've said. But that on its own is not not enough. We need this other work as well, this other work of God to open our eyes, to enable us to see from the scriptures who Jesus is and to come to know him for ourselves. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, it's the work of the Spirit of God. And it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit of God who is God himself who opens the hearts of sinners like us, that we may see Jesus and trust in him, put our faith in him, according to the scriptures. You see, that was the problem, wasn't it, remember? Their faith, those foolish ones, verse 25, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. That was, that's our problem. We can hear it preach, we can understand it, but, but believing it, trusting it, grasping it, really seeing it and taking it of our own, that work is beyond us unless God moves in us to open our eyes. A little bit later in the book of Acts we read of a woman in the town of Philippi called Lydia and she listens to the Bible being preached. She listens to the Apostle Paul opening up the scriptures just as Jesus did here. Speaking about Jesus Christ, just as Jesus did here, from the scriptures. And as she listens, we read, uh, Luke tells us, that the Lord opened her heart. The Lord opened her heart. And she put her trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what we need. That's the key. You see. We need these two things. We need to understand the scriptures. We need the scriptures expounded and opened up to us to show us what it teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ and then we need the Holy Spirit of God to open our understanding to open our eyes as it were our hearts to, to really grasp what the Bible says about Jesus to grasp it to take it for ourselves to believe it to trust in it that we might be saved and walk with Christ and that's why when we, when we come to, 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 to the scriptures, we, we should pray. Uh, we sang that song, didn't we? Um, which was a prayer. It was a prayer that the Lord would open our eyes uh, to understand what the Bible has to say to us in this passage. And whenever you come, whenever you come to the Bible, when you open the Bible yourself in your own, own private devotions, just, just ask the Lord for help, for illumination, to, to open your eyes so that you may understand what it says and grasp it, that it would increase your faith. 
when you uh, come to, to a meeting like this and you're going to hear God's word preached, well, well, pray before you come, as you come, as you're sitting waiting for the meeting to begin, perhaps. Just pray silently that, that the Lord would um, give his Holy Spirit as the word is preached, that you and others would, as his word is preached, see Jesus, not literally with our eyes, physical eyes, but, but by faith, that we would see him and know him and come to know him better and have our faith in him increase. It's what we need as Christians, it's what you need if you're not a Christian. This is your great obstacle. Uh, this is the great thing that you need, to have your eyes opened, like Lydia in Philippi, as these two here, to have your eyes opened by the Holy Spirit, that you may see Jesus for who he is, as the Word of God puts him forward before us, and put your trust in him. Well, that's the work, isn't it, of, of the Lord? It's not something we can control or bring about. All we can do is pray and seek God that he would open the eyes of ourselves and of others to see Jesus and to come to know him and to trust him as he is preached and expounded from God's word. That's why prayer is so important, isn't it? That's why a prayer meeting, church prayer meeting is so important. That we gather together to pray, to ask the Lord that he would send his Holy Spirit, that we would come to know the Lord better through his word, and that others, unbelievers, would come and hear the word of God, and they too would come and see Jesus through his word being expounded and put their trust in him. Our great obstacle, the great hindrance that we have is the slowness of our heart to believe, as he says in verse 25. And our great need is for Christ, by his Holy Spirit, to open our eyes, that we may understand the Scriptures, that our sinful unbelief may be healed, and so we may come to see and to know Christ for who he is. That's how we come to know him in the first place, that's how we come to grow in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Scriptures by the Holy Spirit. Let's seek this for ourselves and for others with earnest, regular prayer to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. well, we're going to sing <coughs> number 345. And this is a prayer for these things. 361. 345. Mm -hmm. Oh, 361. Mm -hmm. 361. Is that what I gave you, Russell? <laughs> we could have either. Um, I prefer three, four, five. Oh. <laughs> yep, three, four, five, three hundred and forty five. Spirit of faith, come down, reveal the things of God, and make to us the Godhead known and witness with the blood, it is yours the blood to apply, and give us eyes to see, who did the guilty sinners die, and surely died for me. 345.
the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.